First, uh, thank you very much to my hosts at the Medienanstalt in Berlin Brandenburg for the invitation to speak at this online event, and thank all of you for taking the time to watch. I will use my time today to offer you a democratic critique of the technology industry. And my argument is pretty simple. I believe that media companies like Google and Facebook have prioritized profits at the expense of the public interest. And that this business model is fundamentally poisoning the health of the marketplace of ideas upon which our democracies depend. This is a big deal. It is not a theoretical problem for academics, and it's not just a case of big companies exploiting their consumers. What's happening here is weakening our democratic self-government. It weakens it because our democracies depend on quality access to information and a space where we can come together as a society and deliberate about the problems uh, that we have to solve. This is the essence of self-government. And today, we have less and less of these. To fix this, we have to do what democracies have always done to protect ourselves. We have to make new laws. And this is the core of my own work. I lead an organization called Reset, and its purpose is to reset the rules and standards that govern technology markets in order to realign their commercial interests with the values of democracy. But let me make a confession. I am a very unlikely champion for regulating the internet. I spent most of my career promoting the virtues of the open internet. I came of age during the internet revolution full of optimism. I was among the early advocates in Washington for policies that shaped the open internet that we have today. I was one of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's digital diplomats during the time of the Arab Spring. And I believe that information technologies can empower new social and political movements and open all of human knowledge to anyone with a smartphone. I believe that the internet is the greatest invention in the history of, uh, of humanity. I'm an idealist at heart, but today I sit before you as a very troubled idealist. Because in the last few years, I have watched as the open internet that was meant to redistribute power from the few to the many, I've seen it become a powerful technology for social manipulation. I've seen it become a powerful technology for political control. And what was once the great hope of revitalizing democracy is now considered by many to be among its greatest threats. This is a bitter irony for me, and it motivates me to, be, to want to be a part of the solution. But to get to those solutions, we first have to understand the nature of the problem. And it is not as easy as it might seem. And I'll use my time now to offer you three ways to look at this problem. And although they all mix together in real life, this way of understanding the problem also helps lead us towards the path to solutions. Solutions that are realistic for the companies and realistic for governments to enforce. So, first part of the problem is the content problem. In our day-to-day -day experience of digital media, the problem of technology and democracy looks like it is primarily about harmful content. The internet is simply flooded with hate speech, disinformation, conspiracy theory, polarizing politics, misogyny, harassment, incitement to violence, and worse. And in the last few years, you know, we've primarily understood this content problem as a threat to democracy and a threat to social welfare. And now, in this terrible time of, of global pandemic with the coronavirus, it is crystal clear why it is also a threat to public health. It was bad enough when nonsense that you read on Facebook could lead you to hold antisocial views or to vote for reactionary politicians. But now it can literally be harmful to your health and to the health of your family. But let's be clear, though. You know, there was always a lot of nonsense on the Internet, awful content on the Internet. That's not new, but it's worse now. And it is worse now for many reasons. Part of the reason is the enormous quantity of information that we are now able to consume uh, uh, through digital media. And part of it is because of the fragmentation of the information market that has come from decentralized communication systems. We have lost touch with this 20th century phenomenon where the media anchored the public debate to a common set of facts delivered by a relatively small number of credible news sources. We experience this content problem most acutely when we're desperate for quality information, like during elections 
And like right now, during a pandemic, we see crazy ideas about why the coronavirus is happening. We see promises of miracle cures. And the best information out there is buried in such an avalanche of rumor and speculation that it's sometimes hard to find and hard to know what's credible and what isn't. But there's much more to it than the content problem. Second part of the problem I want to point out, I call the business model problem. There is a reason why we are experiencing such a high volume of harmful content, and that reason is rooted in the business models of many of the big tech companies. It is known to many now as surveillance capitalism. So that, that starts with control. Two or three companies control a huge percentage of the market of information distribution. Not information production, information distribution. They control what we will see and when we will see it when we're on Facebook looking at our news feeds, when we're on Twitter looking at our Twitter streams, when we're on YouTube watching videos, when we're getting search results. This is a small number of companies that has a huge amount of influence over what kind of information we get to see. This is unprecedented power and it contradicts a century of public policy in democratic societies that have understood the threat that concentrated power in the media market held for the integrity of democracy. But it's not just about control, it's also about the way these companies make money. They have a business model that is designed to select information and media for us that will maximize the time that we spend online. It's called attention optimization. And the more of the, our attention that they capture, the more ads they can sell. And they conduct massive surveillance of everything that we do online to create these very detailed profiles of us so that can, they can predict what content will keep us clicking and will keep us staring at our screens. Consider this for just a second. You know, in the 20th century marketplace uh, of media, of news and information, there were editors and journalists in newsrooms making decisions about what news we would see and how, what information the public would get on a daily basis. They didn't always get it right, and sometimes they let commercial motives uh, interfere with public service values that they uh, were sworn to uphold. But the news industry always had this core value of serving our democracies the information that they needed to work. The technology industry has no such interest in quality information, nor do they have an interest in democratic integrity. The goal of social media and digital media companies is to keep us staring at our screens and looking at ads because that's how they make their money. And what kind of content keeps us glued to our screens? Well, we're human beings, and so it is sensational content that captures our attention. And so the algorithms that these companies use to feed us information based on our personal data is sensational and we get lots and lots of sensational content and we te what we tend to get is content that confirms or radicalizes views that we already had which leads to echo chambers it doesn't mean we never see any credible information it doesn't mean that we only see opinions that agree with us but over months and years of digital media consumption we see distortion and that distortion is more than enough to change what kinds of information we consider normal and to fundamentally alter what we consider credible information. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid it gets worse. Because the third perspective I want to bring to the problem is the exploitation problem. The business model of surveillance capitalism is profitable, enormously profitable. And no matter whether it was intended or not, it does appear to lead us into echo chambers. It does appear to deliver a high uh, proportion of, of crazy conspiracy theories, and amplified hate speech. We are led into temptation by the logic of the modern internet. This commercial structure has been obvious for some years now, and lots of people have figured out how to game that system and to use it for their, to their own advantage. Their own advantage commercially and their own advantage politically. This is the organized exploitation of the digital media market by bad actors. You will all know the story of how the Russians used Facebook ads and fake accounts in the U.S. election in 2016 to try to manipulate the outcome. You may know that these kinds of deceptive online communication strategies are now commonplace in many political campaigns. The idea is to use artificial methods like fake accounts, fake social media engagement to make an idea or a news story appear bigger than it really is. This artificial amplification not only shapes opinion, it crowds out other kinds of content, something known as censorship through noise. Worse, 
these intentionally false stories, they draw big audiences, and those big audiences earn the makers of that con kind of content advertising revenues. It's, it's profiteering on fake news. This is called coordinated inauthentic behavior. Uh, that's what the industry calls it. And, and you might think that's something that only evil spy agencies do in James Bond movies. But that's actually really widespread. You know, you can see just how easy it is to do. Go online and Google, how do I buy fake social media engagement? And you'll come up with a dozen different companies that will sell it to you. And it's cheap. You can buy fake followers, fake views, fake likes, fake shares. It's cheap and easy. And that's the legal market. The black market for these kinds of services is even more sophisticated and dangerous. So what's to be done about all this? I mean, I've, I've laid out a pretty stark picture of the problem. And I've told you that we have to make laws in order to fix it. How do we do that? Unfortunately, there's, there's no silver bullet. There's no single action that any government can take to pass a law and reset the balance between democracy and commercial uh, uh, incentives in, in the media market. It will require a set of changes to law that cause changes to products and practices in the industry that in turn change our behavior as consumers and our outlook on information that we consume online. We have to try this. It will take time, but we've got to, we've got to start moving in the right direction right away. Because if we don't, we'll, we'll never be able to talk to one another to try to solve our biggest problems like climate change or immigration or, or e economic inequality because we need to have a common set of facts that we're operating on. We need to have rational deliberation from credible information sources in order for our democracies to work. What we need is a comprehensive approach, a, a digital social contract. To, to develop and enact that public policy agenda will take work, and it will force us to really work on these problems from the same perspectives that I've just offered you to understand the nature of the problem. So let's look at content problems. And let me first say unequivocally, you cannot delete your way out of the current crisis. There's no amount of government-ordered takedowns of content on the internet that can solve this. And if we try to do that too aggressively, we're going to end up undermining freedom of speech. That said, we, we can draw red lines around clearly illegal content, and we can do a better job of pulling it down. And we can regulate things like political advertising online in order to make it maximally transparent and hold it to a very high standard. We can also begin to regulate the business model problem. We can look at the problems of surveillance capitalism, and we can weaken the machine that is so successful at manipulating us and curating all of our content in ways that polarizes and fragments society. We need to limit data collection, and we need to limit the ways that data can be used. We also need to deal with the enormous market power in, in, in the digital media markets today. We need to make changes to competition law in order to change the structure of the industry. And finally, we need to deal with that exploitation problem. Part of this will be solved by dealing with the, the business model problem, but you know we need rules to make it much more difficult to make money from pushing clickbait. And we need to be much better at finding and removing organized bad actors from our digital media marketplace. But even as we make rules to decrease the supply of harmful content, we need to increase the demand for quality content. We need to be straight with people and tell them how they're being manipulated. We need to help people understand better how to find credible information. We need to help people understand better how to discern credible from not credible information online. We need to invest in education. We need to invest in public service media. We need alternatives to this stream of clickbait and propaganda that dominates digital media today. More fundamentally, we need a very public conversation about the role the digital information markets play in shaping modern democracies. The, the infodemic that has come with the coronavirus has made this even more urgent. This disinformation about public health is not a new problem. It is a symptom of the same problem that we have faced for years now in information markets. And right now we are allowing the power of big tech monopolies to contribute to a crisis in democracy. Our job is not just to stop this from happening, but to reverse it. Our job is to put the power of technology back in the service of democratic renewal. I hope you'll join me in that job. Thank you very much.